How are we all doing? Good. All right. You got your Bibles? There you go. Amen. We're starting to pick up on that now. Good. All right. Let's uh, go ahead and open. Uh, if you want to go to Revelation 12, you can, uh, but we're going to be in Daniel 2. Uh, so uh, I'm just going to touch on one verse in Revelation, uh, well, maybe two verses in Revelation 12, uh, and then we're going to head over to Daniel uh, chapter number 2. Revelation 12 and Daniel 2. All right, so in, in, uh, if you remember, in Revelation 12, <clears throat> John, uh, uh, the Apostle John is uh, uh, writing about this uh, great wonder that he sees in heaven. And if you remember, he sees this woman uh, clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and then uh, this uh, child, uh, 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 being, uh, being with child, uh, in, in travailing and birth, pain to be delivered, verse 2. And then we see that there's appeared another wonder in heaven, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns. And so if you remember, we talked about this a couple weeks back because we're talking. If you, let's, let's take a step back real quick and just remind ourselves what, what we're doing. <clears throat> We've been talking about uh, what happened uh, with Lucifer prior to uh, his fall, Right? Uh, and, and, and potentially was what happened taking place between Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2. We're not talking about, I want to be very clear, just in case I haven't been, uh, I'm not suggesting there, there, you know, people like to suggest gap theories and things like that. I'm, I'm, I, don't, I don't know that we need to go there. I would rather just go with Scripture. Um, I don't know that we need to say there's a gap theory, but, but certainly uh, we, can, we can come to the conclusion uh, that, you know, Satan fell, we know that Lucifer, he fell, and at some point he 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 fell, and we're trying to determine uh, when that was. And and again, I think it fits uh, with other scripture. When you start comparing scripture with scripture, I think it fits pretty good right there between Genesis one one and one two. When you start to take those words found in Genesis one two and compare them with other scripture, you start to go, okay, wait a minute, something's up here. So we're kind of doing a, 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 a trek through the Bible about this Lucifer guy, trying to understand a little bit about him. Uh, listen, uh, why would we want to do that? Uh, well, probably one of the, the biggest reasons why I would say we certainly don't want to give him any fanfare. He doesn't deserve any. Uh, and we certainly don't want to give him any props because he doesn't deserve any of those either. But what I would say is this, we're in a war. And when you're in a battle, you need to know who your enemy is. And you need to know what your enemy is about, and you need to know what your enemy's battle plan is, or else you're not going to do a very good job of fighting the battle against them. Hence the reason why there is a lot of information in the Bible about this, this, uh, this person that we call Satan. Uh, listen, I can, I can tell you this, okay, as Christians, he's not happy with, with any, uh, any of us, and he's certainly not going to give us peace. He's not going to uh, allow us that, uh, that privilege. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ gives us peace, but we've got to choose to either walk in the flesh or, or, or the, in the spirit. Because if we're walking in the flesh, well, then we're, 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 we're doing our own selves some problems there. And, and I don't think peace comes with walking in the flesh. Uh, I mean, I know it doesn't for me. I don't know about all you, but I know when I'm walking in the flesh, uh, peace is not what follows. It's when you're walking in the spirit. That, that peace is following, and, 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 and we can just give it over uh, to our Lord. But, okay, again, this is why we're kind of doing this. And, and on top of that, we are preparing for uh, when we launch into our actual study of the book of Revelation. Having a lot of this in our back pocket is going to help us have a better understanding of the things that are going on in Revelation. Revelation is a big book. It, it really is, once you kind of start grabbing onto things, it really actually is a fairly... Uh, easy book to understand, uh, but it can be very daunting if, if, you, uh, if you don't have those, uh, 
those, uh, the, the, the mindset of, 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 of understanding of some things that helps us understand the book. With all that being said, uh, the one thing I wanted to pay attention today, okay, so you, you remember, who's the woman? It's Israel. Very, very important that we understand that that's Israel. Because if we make that the church, or if we make that uh, anybody else for that matter, we're going to run ourselves into a lot of trouble, uh, because then now you're going to have to replace where that, is, where that event in Revelation 12 is taking place. If it's Israel, then we can understand that that is taking place in the tribulation, and, and certainly uh, Revelation chapter number 6 through 19 uh, it's talking about the tribulation period. So, okay, so the woman's Israel. So, uh, okay, so then, and, and then now, now uh, I think I heard somebody say Mary. So Mary is from Israel. <laughs> She's a Jew, right? We don't want to say it's Mary because it's not Mary, although it is Mary who is the one that delivered the child Jesus because that's who the man child is. It's Jesus, amen? All right, the, the, the great red dragon, verse number nine, we're very clear on that, who that is, because it was the serpent called the devil and Satan. So we know uh, uh, right here in this passage uh, who, that, uh, who that great red dragon is. But remember now, it's telling us that this great red dragon has how many heads? Okay. And so we've, we've talked about that. And here's the thing you want to know about uh, uh, that, right? Uh, I've seen so many commentaries. I've seen so many people get this wrong. And this is how you're going to mess up. First of all, this is how you're going to mess up any scripture in the Bible. But definitely when you come to the book of Revelation, you're definitely going to mess it up going here because it is what they would call an apocalyptic book. It's talking about stuff that, that is beyond, uh, uh, you know, uh, it almost seems like it's, it's just uh, fantasy, if you will. Here's the thing you need to understand about the Bible. Get this in your soul if you haven't already got it in your soul. You never need to go outside of the Bible to interpret anything in the Bible. And if you need to go outside of the Bible to do it, there's where you're going to run into trouble. There's where you're going to have problems because anybody's imagination, remember what we talked about sin, right? It's, it, our imaginations are wicked. Right? So you put your imagination into it, or if you put presupposition, which many people do, and listen, just because we're a Baptist church, let's be careful we don't do that, okay? But if you put presuppositions into the Bible, uh, well, you're going to mess it all up, man. What you got to do is just let God just tell you what everything is. And that's why the art of comparing Scripture with Scripture, spiritual things with spiritual things, as Paul says over there in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, is so vitally important to our understanding of Scripture. No prophecy of the Scripture, Peter tells us, is for any private interpretation. We don't go to Scripture and interpret it for ourselves just because we don't understand it. If you don't understand it, take a step back, give it to the Lord, and wait till he reveals it to you in the scripture. Don't just start putting your own ideas of what you think it means in there. If you do that, I'm telling you, man, it will, it, it's, it's just not going to work out very well. Uh, it just won't. But when you run through the Bible and you look at the seven heads of, uh, 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 of uh, Satan's heads here, what you're going to realize is, okay, Israel is the epicenter of the Bible. All prophecy in the Bible centers on Israel. I know that's a big news flash because a lot of people like to think it centers on the church. No, nope, no, nope. it does not center on the church. It centers on Israel. Israel is the epicenter. So, Israel was given a very specific plot of land. Remember, Satan doesn't like that. Because that plot of land was Satan's. We talked about that the last, you know, the last couple of weeks, right? This is why all this stuff is kind of important. And, and listen, all that's going over on over in Israel right now is important. <laughs> it's all biblically based. This is all stuff that's supposed to go down here uh, as we are, are, are finishing up in the last days. Because I do believe we're in the very last of the last days. Okay? Uh, but, you know, I'm not going to tell you how much time we have left because I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. All I know is we can look at the birth signs and know we're getting closer. And, and, and certainly I believe we are. But 
everything in the Bible is going to be focused around Israel. That's why I, I wanted to make that point in Genesis 12, uh, not Genesis, Revelation 12, of who that woman is. Satan's attacking who? Israel in the tribulation. Okay? Hence the reason why that's important to make sure we understand that, because what it helps us then understand is, okay, what are these seven heads? And when you look at the seven heads of Satan's uh, 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 satanic system of government in the world, okay? Because, again, remember, uh, 1 Corinthians 4.4, 4, he's the little G God of this world. Y'all remember that? Right? Okay? And, and so he is, I'm just going to use the word, right? He's hell-bent on the destruction of man, and he's hell-bent on wanting to rule the world. Okay. When you start running through those seven heads, it becomes real easy to, 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 to define them biblically because the Bible uh, gives it to us. So who was the first one to usurp Israel? It was Egypt, right? You all remember the story over there in, 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 uh, in Exodus, right? Who was the second one? It was Assyria. Okay, and here's the key about those first two. By the time you get to Daniel, they have already done their stuff. Okay, so when Daniel sees the vision, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, and then Daniel sees a vision over in chapter number 7, he's not focused on the two that have already passed. He's now looking at the four coming in the future. And then we get a nice little... And we're going to see that tonight, but you got Babylon, you got Media Persia, you got Greece, Russia, Alexander the Great, and then you got Rome. But then there was something about Rome, the, the, the great and dreadful beast, that was diverse from the others that came before them. It actually broke into pieces and as Daniel says, it's going to actually, quote-unquote, revive itself. So here's something just to kind of give you a, a little understand, a pre-understanding, if you will. This is where we are right now. You say, Rome's not in control. Yes, it is. And I'm not trying to be ugly about this. I'm just trying to be biblical about it. What happened to the Roman Empire after it crumbled is the military power was destroyed, but then something arose out of the military power that then took control over the earth. And that's the Roman Catholic Church. I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm just trying to tell you what happened. History is going to back this up. Scripture is going to back this up if you give me enough time to show you, and, and I will. Uh, but what's going to happen here is something very unique from all the rest Something's going to happen in that tribulation period that's going to revive the, the military power of Rome. Okay? Is everybody kind of with me right now? If, if you don't agree with that or you don't like that, that's fine. We don't need to butt heads on that right at the moment. You just give me enough time, and then we'll, we'll let Scripture show us some things, and we'll see if maybe there might be some truth to it later. Is that fair? Okay, good. Thank you. All right. Now, here's the thing you want to know about Egypt and Assyria. All through the Bible, Egypt is a representation of what? The world. Okay, so oftentimes, remember what I tried to tell you last week when I was showing you all those different, uh, uh, you know, I'm, gonna, I, I'm not going to turn around, I'm just going to remind you. Mountains in the Bible is what? Kingdoms, trees, men, cities, uh, uh, you have kings, you have dark. Darkness doesn't necessarily mean what? That it's, the lights are out. It also could be talking about the evil realm and, and things that are going on within that area. Um, when you're talking about the trees, you got the wilderness, the garden, the branches, the vineyard, the briars, thorns, root, all those things are, are very important. Fowls, oftentimes in the Bible, are, are representative of what? Demons, devils. The Bible actually uses the word devils, so we'll use that word. Um, uh, Satan and, and, the, and his, uh, his fallen angels are, are in the... Because in, Satan is the prince of the power of the... So he's in that second heaven. 
But in that second heaven, there's a body of water. And that body of water is called what? The deep, the sea. And then there's a frozen piece of glass that separates the second heaven from the third heaven that doesn't allow Lucifer and the angels to get into the third heaven. And what we're going to find later, which is absolutely crazy, Job 38 talks about this, Revelation 4 talks about this, there's actually literally a door that separates the second heaven and the third heaven. Kind of makes a little, now you go when Jesus goes, I am the door. <laughs> well, wow, you know, that's kind of cool, right? And then when you see Jacob's ladder that ascends up and down, you all get what, something's going on here. And, and listen, does, all, does any of that matter to us from a, from a spiritual a aspect? I don't know, but I don't know about you. If God's talking about it, I think it's cool. And I'm in. I want to know what God wants to say about this stuff. And then oftentimes what you find out is there actually is something we need to make sure we understand about this because it does have a spiritual application. So don't just throw all that stuff as just cool. If, if all this stuff is, is cool to you, God doesn't care about cool. God cares about truth, and God cares about what are you going to do with the truth now. Right? It's got, to make a, it's got to make a change in us. Amen? All right, so Egypt is a picture of the world in the Bible. And uh, so obviously if it's a picture of the world, Pharaoh is a picture of who? Right? And, and uh, I can't remember the passage right now. Was it Ezekiel 27, I think, where Ezekiel 29 maybe, where he, he actually says that Pharaoh is dragon, is, is the dragon. He actually gives that connection. And then Assyria in the Bible is a picture of Antichrist. Okay? And, and, and we haven't talked enough about that yet to, to give you the biblical proof of that yet. I'm just throwing that out to you right now for food for thought. We'll, 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 we'll let the Bible flesh that out later. Uh, but the point is, here is your seven heads. Okay? Now I want to show you... Uh, this is free. You don't have to pay me for this, but this is kind of fun. Watch this. Uh, go to Revelation chapter number uh, seven, 16, 17. <clears throat> yeah, 17. Check this out now. Now watch this. So you're over there in uh, uh, Revelation 17, verse 8. And you go, the beast that thou, that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, whom they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. And here is mine which had wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the women sitteth. Well, that's interesting. Okay, because remember what... what what were mountains representative of? Okay, see why, this, why understanding these things are important? Are those seven kingdoms? There you go. Okay, now watch this. And there are seven kings. Five are fallen. One is and the other is not yet come. <laughs> All right, let's just see. Five are fallen... One is, and one is yet to come. See? Now you start to go, wait, well, hold on a second, this book is cool. And what's interesting about it is, to this day, it's still right. It's still right. Of course it would be. <laughs> God wrote it. Amen? Okay, that, that was free. You don't have to pay me for that. Have fun with that. Do whatever you want with it. Uh, I, I, just, I like stuff like that when, when, God's, when God's word shows itself. And I just, when he, when he, when, you know, I, God is definitely not up there trying to show off, but he definitely can show off with his book, amen? He definitely can. All right, check it out. Revelation, uh, I'm sorry, Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. We want to look at this, and, and again, we're trying to, what, what I'm trying to do right now is, 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 not that I feel like I need to, but I want to, 
uh, let God prove out what we're saying here so that it's not just me telling you this is what it is and you just going, well, he said it was, that's what it was. I guess that's what it was. No, no, no. I want God's word to prove it out, okay? Uh, again, remember, as you go through Scripture, who is the one that Israel fell into captivity first? No, no questions asked, right? Who, the northern kingdom of Israel went into captivity in 722 B.C.? To the second one up here, that is, did that, is that in the scripture? All over the place, absolutely. Okay, now what has happened with Daniel is in uh, 606 B.C., now remember, the, uh, the nation of Israel, after the death of Solomon, anybody remember what happened to it? It split into two kingdoms. It split into the northern kingdom, of Israel, and it split into the southern kingdom of Judah. Okay? So this happened in 722 BC. Babylon Babylon in 606 BC took over the northern kingdom of Israel and put it under captivity. Then 19 years later, in 587 B.C., it took over the southern kingdom of Israel and usurped it. Okay? So this is where the nation of Israel now falls into captivity. The reason why that's important is because if you want to understand what's going on here, uh, or what, if you want to understand, I'm sorry, what's going on in Daniel 9, that information is going to become important. We'll deal with that later. Uh, but I just want you to have that in the back of your mind, maybe write notes, whatever. If you want to understand what's going on in Daniel 9, this information is going to become vitally important to us. But for the purpose of tonight, of looking at Daniel chapter 2, here's what I want you to get into your mind. Israel has now gone into captivity to Babylon. Daniel has been taken uh, with his, his uh, boys there. Y'all remember his boys, right? And, and they've been brought into uh, captivity to uh, uh, Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar is the king, right? There's something special about Daniel because he won't eat the, the, the king's meat, right? He doesn't, wanna, he doesn't want to assimilate into the Babylonian ways of thinking, right? He's separating himself from there, uh, obviously, Here's an interesting thing about Daniel. Uh, there's only two people in all the Bible that God specifically says, I love. Like, like writers of the Bible. Where he specifically says, my beloved. My, you know, does anybody know who those two people are? Daniel and John. Now, certainly he loves us. I mean, I, for God so loved the world. Like, I'm not trying to get a... But I think it's interesting, he like gives a very like a very special call out to these two guys. Why that's important to grab onto is because, listen, there is absolutely no way you could ever understand the book of Revelation without understanding the book of Daniel. And you cannot understand the book of Daniel without understanding the book of Revelation. They go hand in hand. Okay? Of course, who wrote, who wrote Daniel? Daniel. And who wrote Revelation? Why? Because both those books are dealing with the, the apocalyptic events of, of these last days going into the tribulation, without doubt. And we get really, really deep information out of these two books. But anyways, get the story. Daniel's in captivity, and Nebuchadnezzar has this dream. He sees this great vision of this uh, 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 big statue, if you will, and, and he, he goes to his, 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 uh, his wise men, I almost want to go there right now, but I can't. <laughs> Listen, you want to know what's going on in Matthew chapter 2 when the wise men come to go see Jesus when he was born? You got to understand where those wise men came from. And you got to understand how they knew that Jesus was going to be born. They got all the information from this boy Daniel. And we'll tie that during Christmas. <laughs> we'll, we'll wait till we get to around there. It's, that's a pretty cool stuff to do all that. You go, whoa, wait a second. Uh, that's pretty cool. Anyways, because the wise men are the, the magi. That's what they are. 
Okay, so he, go, he goes, Nebuchadnezzar goes to his wise men and he tells them their dream and he says, well, here's the problem, okay? I want to tell you my dream, but I can't really quite remember what happened in my dream, so you're going to have to tell me what I saw in my dream. Your wise men tell me. And the wise men are like, we can't do that. What, what are you kidding me? Nobody, nobody can do that. And, and then Nebuchadnezzar says, well, all right, well, if you can't tell me, then I'm going to kill you. Right? And so now, this gets back to Daniel and his boys there, and Daniel goes, well, that don't sound good. So him and his boys have a little prayer meeting uh, uh, one night, and they're praying to the God of heaven, and the God of heaven comes down and interprets the dream for him and shows them. And so then he goes back to, Daniel goes back to Nebuchadnezzar and says, hey, hey, uh, king, let me, let me tell you something. I know your boys can't figure it out, and there's probably no man on earth can figure it out, but I can tell you who can. There's a God in heaven who can figure it out, and let me tell you the dream and the interpretation thereof. And he tells them. Everybody with me? Okay, so what the dream was, if you look at this in chapter number two, you see... Uh, <clears throat> Verse number, let's start in 31. It says, Thou, O king, sawest and behold a great image. The great image was bright, whose brightness was excellent stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. So please forgive me of my drawing. I'm not an artist, and I don't got time to draw this. Here's my image. You ready? There's my image. Go with it. Just go with it. <laughs> so he sees this great image, okay? And, and, and when you look at this great image, Pam, why are you laughing at me, man? Pam, I saw you laughing. Pam, I saw you laughing at me. <laughs> She's laughing at me, man. And terrible. No, no the, the, the image was terrible. The image was terrible. That's why I drew it that way. I, I was trying to make sure we got that. All right, so verse 32. The image head was of fine gold. So we find out this head was of gold. Okay? And then it says, and his breast and his arms of silver. So now, how many arms you got? By the way, it was called, because this kingdom was, Two, Media Persia, okay? Two arms. Y'all with me on that? Okay? And, and then it says here, his, uh, uh, and his belly and his thighs of brass. And then how many legs you got? By the way, you want to know what the Roman Empire did? Split into two. <laughs> okay. Anyways, uh, and, and then it says, and uh, his feet uh, were part of iron and part of clay, and then what we're going to find out about, about that feet is that the feet had ten toes. Okay? Everybody, everybody with me right now? All right, and then it says, Thou sawest till that a stone was cut without hands, which smote the image. Where? So we get this big stone that's going to smite the image on the feet. Everybody see that? Okay. And then it says, it will, break, uh, it will break them to pieces. Then was the iron and the clay, the brass, the silver, the gold, broken to pieces together and became like the shaft of a summing threshing floor. Okay. That word threshing floor is an important word. So I want to just put that up here for you a second. Right. Talk about that in a second. Okay. And then it says here, and the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So this stone's going to become a great mountain. Is everybody tracking with me so far? Okay. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thankfully. <laughs> right? Uh, not only did Daniel get the, what the dream was, but he was able to interpret it as well. So now look at verse number uh, 38. Uh, drop down to the last sentence of verse 38. He says, thou, again, who's Daniel talking to? Thou art this head of gold. So who's the head of gold? Babylon. So 
Babylon's the head of gold. Then it says, And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. Does anybody, does anybody know about Alexander's kingdom? Did it bear rule over all the earth? And his, again, remember that the earth was that, you know, that area at that time. Nobody knew about all the surrounding areas. It, when Alexander's kingdom came in, he, in seven years, he took control over the known world at the time. He was in complete control. And then it says here, And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things. Did the Roman Empire do that? Yes, it did. And as the iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and the toes, part of the potter's clay and part of the iron, the kingdom shall be divided. Was the Roman Empire divided? Yes, it was. But there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. Now there's a bunch of stuff that's going on in there that I'm not going to deal with right now when we actually get into the study of all this. We'll break this down. I'm just trying to give us the big picture right now. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. Talk about that right now, but I can't. Uh, but they shall not cleave to one another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings, and what he's talking about right now is in the days of these kings, these ten toes, in the days of those kings shall the God of heaven uh, uh, set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces, the iron, the brass, the clay, and the silver, and the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is, and the interpretation thereof. So in other words, my friends, everybody look up at me. God put his stamp on it. It's certain and it's sure. This is the way it's going down. Now, there's a couple of things I, I think are really interesting about this. You've got to recognize that Daniel wrote this book while he was in. None of this other stuff ha happened yet. And he was not alive when any of this stuff happened. And you go, well, okay, that's, that's cool because what, this is what a lot of people try to say. Well, the, the, the book of Daniel was, was written later. It was lit, written later. The problem is, you remember what we talked about a couple weeks ago when I talked about those Dead Sea Scrolls? Uh -huh. One of the books that were in those Dead Sea Scrolls was the book of, and it was dated back to 500 B.C. What are you going to do with that now? <laughs> so secu sec the secular world has a problem with that. They can't give you an answer to that. And so, of course, that's where you're now going to have people try to come in here and start to throw in their own interpretations of things. Well, he wasn't talking about that. He was talking about this. He was doing, y'all get what's going on here? Okay, but if we just let the Bible be the Bible, and let, let God lay out the answers for us, we don't need to go to uh, what the God of this world is trying to do, and that is confuse us. All right, so let me just lay this out for you real quick, and we'll be done for tonight. Next week, we will go into Daniel chapter 7. Because there's more information that's going to get thrown into this that's going to help us really pull this puzzle together. But let me just give you a quick overview of what we got right here, and we'll call it a night. So what happens is Babylon is the head of gold. Uh, Media Persia is, sil is the silver. It had two arms because it had uh, two kingdoms, Media and Persia, right, that was in control. And we're going to find something else about that, 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 that kingdom in the bear, that we're going to talk about in, in, in next week, okay? The brass was Alexander the Great's kingdom. That we're going to find out, which it actually did, is going to break into four kingdoms after Alexander the Great's uh, uh, death. Uh, it's the leopard with four heads, okay? We're going to talk about that uh, next week. But again, it's exactly what it did, okay? Then you talk about those legs, which is the Roman Empire, which again, it broke uh, sometime right after Constantine, uh, three, 
305 AD, somewhere in that area. Uh, somewhere soon after that, the Roman Empire splits into two, an eastern and a western leg, okay? The, uh, and then what ends up happening is that uh, the military might of the Roman Empire falls, 476 BC, my memory serves me correct, is when the military uh, 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 power falls, but then what came up right behind that? The RCC. Now listen, here's something you need to know about, here's facts. Facts are a, I don't, I've been studying this stuff long enough, and I've been involved in this stuff, and I've studied, and I've looked at this stuff long enough to tell you this. I can tell you with an absolute 100% guaranteed fact that the Roman Catholic Church did not start with Peter. It didn't. There's no way they can prove that. They've got nothing. The Roman Catholic Church started in 476 B.C. That was the first pope. There was no pope prior to that. You can sit there and call all those guys pope in the back end if you want to make yourself feel better, but I'm just telling you, you got no evidence to prove that. The facts do not back it up. But what Rome did is it went from this military uh, 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 entity to this spiritual entity. Now, I'm not trying to be ugly. I, I, listen, man, I'm Italian. Salvaggio, got it? You put a bunch of vowels on a last name, you probably got an Italian. There you go, right? Listen, I, I, my whole family's Roman Catholic. My, my mother wasn't Roman Catholic until I got saved. Then all of a sudden, she was Roman, the best Roman Catholic that ever lived on planet Earth. I, I'm just telling you, I, I'm not trying to be ugly against it. When I got saved, I thought I was Roman Catholic. I didn't know any better, right? But then I started looking at stuff, and I started studying stuff, and I'm just telling you, something doesn't add up. Something's not right. The doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church do not line up with the Bible. And what's so dangerous about it is, it's about 70% truth. But you throw in that 30%, but then once you get down into it, you go, wait, but, whoa, but that's where, it. see, they call it the same thing we call it, but they mean something different. And that's what's dangerous. I'm not trying to be ugly, I'm just trying to tell you the truth. Okay? Don't get mad at me. Go look for yourself. Get a Roman catechism. I've got one. Go read it. And then compare it to the Bible and tell me what you think. Just start right there. You don't have to go anywhere else. Just go right there. How is the Pope God's representative on planet Earth? Man don't do that. God don't do that. No. So what you're telling me is when the Pope sits in ex cathedra on his throne, that what he says is truth, even if it goes against the Bible? And we're okay with that? No, man. Something's up here. Anyways, I don't want to get off on that track, because I could. But grab onto this, okay? So here's where we are right now. But remember what it said here. But in the days of those kings, what kings? Those ten toes. Now, you remember what this head, ten, seven heads had? Ten what? Huh? Remember that? There you go. There's your ten horns. And then what we're going to find out probably next week is out of that comes a little horn. And that's the Antichrist, you understand. All that is going to take place when? In the tribulation period. That, so in other words, we aren't here yet. Okay, so Rome 2 has not happened yet. But what's going to happen is in the days of these kings... A stone, <laughs> and if I could just throw a little emphasis on the stone, I want to put a capital S. Who's the stone? The rock. Huh? The stone cut without hands. In other words, he's not man-made, my friends. What's he going to do? He's going to come down, and he's going to smite the image on its feet. What's Jesus going to do at his second coming? Y'all getting this now? You're grabbing onto what's going on here? He's gonna, and then he's going to set up a kingdom, and it's going to become a great mountain. Remember what, remember what mountains represent in the Bible? Okay. He's going to set up his 
millennial kingdom, which there's going to be no end. Everlasting. Isn't that what, it said? Didn't, didn't, didn't that what Daniel 2 told us? Okay, so now you're, grab, you're grabbing down what we're throwing down now. You, you get what's going on here. The one thing I want you to understand about this word threshing floor, it's, it's another word we probably should throw in the back of our, our board here of words that you need to understand. 99% of the time, that might not be right. A lot of the time in the Bible, when you see that word threshing floor, pop in your head, tribulation. Because I'm telling you, a lots of times it is talking about the tribulation period. Okay? And so again, uh, just kind of throw that in, in your uh, back pocket. All right. I think that's a good place to stop right there. Good? Good stuff? Okay, well, again, we're just trying to build this composite. 